good to have a nail back in my hand again. I think I live life better with a nail. <coughs> this is my 40th Lent as a Christian. I gave my life to Christ at 10 years old. This is my 40th Lent. I didn't think about that until I just knelt there. It's overwhelming to tell you the truth. You know, Jason and I talk about this a lot. We speak from our pain too much. And I'm only going to touch on this for a second this evening. But I will tell you, in all my years of pastoring, Yesterday was probably one of the hardest days of my pastoral life. I didn't have anything left when I got home. Nothing. But it's amazing to me. Um, and I want you to pray for some, some people tonight. Uh, Ernie and Nancy Michael that were on the pilgrimage with us. Last fall, Ernie was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And he doesn't have long for this world unless the Lord heals him. In Mannington tonight, they had a, um, a prayer vigil for Ernie and Nancy. This is public knowledge. 20 years ago, the Saturday night before we moved into this property, I got a call from them, and their son had slipped into a coma. They said, we don't even know if you remember us. I said, oh my gosh, I remember you. You were part of my first church. They said, our son is in a coma. Would you come? And I went out there. And within two weeks, Robbie died. And that family buried their son. A couple of years ago, on Labor Day, their grandson was driving home from his girlfriend's in Buckhannon. Fell asleep in his truck hit a tree, and I stood with that family again, and we buried their grandson. And at 7.22 this morning, Nancy texted me and said, I don't know how much more I can take. The love of my life of 50 years is saying goodbye. And I know I lift my prayers to God, but sometimes I'm not sure they're getting past the ceiling. And a, a lady who sounded more like Job this morning than Nancy Guys, listen, will you intercede for this family with me? When I walked in the house yesterday, after a heavy afternoon, I opened the door, and the first person I saw was my youngest son, Cameron. And I just started crying. And he said, what's wrong, Dad? And I said, Cam, these are the hardest days as a pastor. Addiction is all around us, guys. Pain from our past is all around us. Even when we live for Christ every day and share the gospel in beautiful ways. And there's moms and dads out there that have buried their daughters. And they don't know if there's a reason to live anymore, but they're trying. They're trying every day. And there's women and daughters and a son who don't know whether the dad of their household is going to live because he's been in ICU for the last month after being shot twice in a helicopter on the way to Ruby right now. Then you can just make one more call a woman who's been married to her husband for 50 years and buried the son and buried the grandson and now is saying goodbye to her husband. I said, Cam, some days it's just tough. And he said, come here, Dad. And he just hugged me. I just cried for a little while. Look, guys, if we don't hold in Jesus Messiah, we're not going to make it through this life. I'm better with a nail in my hand. 
I'm better with a nail in my hand. Not through my wrist like his, but just remembering. Just remembering every day that we live that a man gave his life so that we could spend all of our days living in the land of the living. And we never have to taste death. In a world of death, we don't have to taste death. And when it's right there in front of your mouth, there will always be a 20-year-old kid to open his arms and just say, come here, Dad. This is my 40th Lent, and I am glad to celebrate the crucified, buried, and resurrected Lord Jesus Christ with you. All right, let's do this together, okay? Tonight, I want to talk about Jeremiah. God, forgive me that I'm only given one week to Jeremiah. That's crazy. I want to start off with some rough words, okay? I've been giving you quotes every week. When I started my sabbatical, this poet that I read often, I ran across a quote by him. He's had a rough life. And when this quote he wrote about hell, and I don't know what he believes, I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but it struck a chord with me. They say that hell is crowded, yet when you're in hell, you always seem to be alone. And you can't tell anyone when you're in hell, or they'll think you're crazy. And being crazy is being in hell. And being sane is hellish too. <laughs> Those who escape hell, however, never talk about it. And nothing much bothers them after that. I mean, things like missing a meal, going to jail, wrecking your car, or even the idea of death itself. When you ask them, how are things? They'll always answer, fine, just fine. Once you've been to hell and back, that's enough. It's the greatest satisfaction known to man. Once you've been to hell and back, you don't look behind you when the floor creaks, and the sun is always up at midnight, and things like the eyes of mice or an abandoned tire in a vacant lot can make you smile once you've been to hell and back. <laughs> I told somebody about you yesterday, John. I said, my brother was dead for 30 minutes. He is alive again. And you've never turned back, and you never will, I don't think. Hmm. That man that they're flying to Ruby right now, who was shot twice last, four weeks ago, we were standing in my office one day, and he said, Rev, you've got a shutoff switch. At some point, you'll stop fighting in order to save your life. Me, well, I've seen and experienced every kind of pain in my life, so I don't have a shutoff switch. I'll fight until I die if that's what it takes. And I hope he doesn't die. I hope he lives. He's my friend. And I want him to live. I want him to live for his children. And I want him to live for a woman who's loved him for many, many years. Oh, frankly, selfishly, I want him to live for me. Because I love him with every part of who I am. I hope he lives. You guys know I walk every single morning. Well, not every morning. I skipped today. <laughs> I knew I was going to be here late. This is my bedtime. <laughs> but I was listening to this monk from Vietnam. I'm reading a book by him right now. And he says, in Vietnam, we grow the most beautiful flowers. They're called lotus flowers. But we grow them in the mud the lotus flower blooms most beautifully from the deepest and thickest mud. My favorite story in the book of Jeremiah about Jeremiah is when he has prophesied God's word his entire life. He was called as a young man to be a prophet. And after prophesying God's word his entire life, and it was never good news, it was always bad news. It was always muddy prophecy. 
King Zedekiah saw to it that Jeremiah was thrown in an old abandoned well. And he was stuck up to his chest in muck and mire and mud. And they pulled him up out of there. And he continued to live beautifully. The lotus flower blooms most beautifully from the deepest and thickest mud. I don't know if you're in hell tonight or not, but I want you to get out of there. I want you to bloom this evening. And I don't know how much has been done to you in your life. I don't know how hard it's been, but you've got a reason to live. You've got a reason to live and not die. Because when you're weak, a brother will anoint you and a son will catch you. And you'll make it. And when I'm weak, you'll anoint and catch. And all of us will live because he died for us. And he was buried for us. And he rose from the dead for us. Whew. My Lord and my God. Let's talk about Jeremiah tonight. To be present and to prepare, we must remember. To be fully present in this moment and be prepared for the cost of discipleship and the culmination of the kingdom of God, we must remember, Jeremiah was a prophet in the 6th century BCE who prophetically declared death, burial, and resurrection foreshadowing Jesus Messiah. Now don't be confused by this Old Testament prophetic book. This entire book is a very real, lived out parable, prophecy that points to Jesus' death, Jesus' burial, and Jesus' resurrection. In a very real way, Jerusalem dies. Jerusalem is buried, and Jerusalem is resurrected. And when we are able to see Messiah in the book of Jeremiah, we understand what the book means. And we understand why Jeremiah lived his life as he lived his life. God, forgive me that I'm only speaking one week on Jeremiah, but I think we're going to get it this evening. Hmm. Let's go through this. Jeremiah's high story, his history. Let's look at Jeremiah 1. Go ahead, Nathan. Nathan. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. Pause for a second. Israel is divided at this time. There are 12 tribes within Israel, 10 northern tribes, two southern tribes. By this point, the 10 northern tribes have already been carried off into exile by the Assyrians. There are two tribes left, Judah and Benjamin, and they are living in Jerusalem, okay? When we read the story of Jeremiah, this is the story of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, coming down, destroying Jerusalem, destroying the temple, destroying the sacrificial system that went on in the temple, and carrying the tribes of Judah and Benjamin away from Jerusalem to Babylon, modern-day Iraq, for 70 years. And at the end of the 70 years, they were brought back. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the 11th year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Woo! Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. 
Jeremiah says back, alas, sovereign Lord. I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm just a kid. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, don't you say I'm too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Don't you be afraid of them. I'm with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. And then the Lord reached out his hand. Wow, that's amazing. He's right there in front of him. This isn't a voice from heaven. This is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord our God. Looking at him like I'm looking at you right now. And he reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. There it is. That's your key scripture right there. That's the mark. I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms. When God came to Abraham in Genesis 12, he says to Abraham, in you all the peoples of the world will be blessed. See, today, Jeremiah, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to do what? To uproot and tear down death, hmm. to destroy and overthrow burial, to build and to plant resurrection. And the word of the Lord came to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see the branch of an almond tree. And the Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I'm watching to see that my word is fulfilled. And then the word of the Lord came to me again, what do you see? And I answered, I see a pot that is boiling. It is tilting toward us from the north. What does that mean? Jerusalem's here. Babylon's up here. And the pot is pouring down from the north upon them. That's what that means. Babylon is coming. Nebuchadnezzar is coming. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. Gary and Sandy, do you remember what Ayuda called Jerusalem? The land. Called it the land. <laughs> Destruction is coming from the north on all who live in the land. I'm about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. And that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah second tribe. I will pronounce my judgments on my people. Why? Because of their wickedness in forsaking me. What does the Bible say? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. As he's speaking of Judah and Benjamin, he's speaking of us. That real story is a picture of all humanity. In burning incense to other gods and in worshiping what their hands have made. We've worshiped creation over creator. You get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. Why? For I'm with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. That's the story of the book of Jeremiah. Death. God says through the prophet Jeremiah that Judah and Benjamin, all of those living in Jerusalem, because of their years of sin, Jerusalem, the temple, and temple worship would die. Death. After Nebuchadnezzar went through there, knocked down the walls, knocked down the temple, burned the city, stopped all worship, he carried 
the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles north into exile into the region of Babylon. Burial. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God tells Judah and Benjamin, those living in Jerusalem, after the death, after the city is destroyed, the temple is torn down, and the sacrificial system is killed off, they would be buried in exile for 70 years. God says through the prophet Jeremiah, I don't care how much they beg this time. I don't care how much they plead. They're going into exile, and they're not leaving one second earlier than the 70 years. They're going to be buried in Babylon. They might as well get jobs. They might as well buy houses. They might as well have babies because they ain't coming back for 70 years. They will be stuck in the grave of Babylon for 70 years of exile. I don't want to hear it. They ain't getting it out. Death, burial, resurrection. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God tells Judah and Benjamin, those living in Jerusalem, after their 70-year burial and exile, God would resurrect them by bringing them back to reestablish Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, and reinstitute worship in the sacrificial system. If you're following my daily devotionals, that's what Ezra and Nehemiah are all about. At the end of the exile, a handful of them come home, rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple, and reinstitute the sacrificial system. I'm going to kill you off. I'm going to bury you for 70 years, but I'm going to resurrect you from the dead. Oh, my goodness. The story of Jeremiah is the story of uprooting and tearing down, destroying and overthrowing, building and planting. It is a foreshadowing of Jesus, Messiah. Now, every year when kids graduate from high school, we all buy cards. They have nothing to do with what the Scripture actually means. This has no connection to goal setting in your life. Jeremiah 2011 that's hanging in your grandmother's dining room has nothing to do with the silliness that we have attached to it. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the, trust me, you don't want those plans in your life. Do you want God to destroy everything you have? Do you want to be carried off into exile for the next 70? That's the plans that we're talking about. Oh, we messed that one all up. For I know, that, see, this is Jeremiah 29. There's a whole lot of chapters to go and a whole lot of destruction and a whole lot of exile. But I know the plans you got for me, God, and it's all good. Not according to this book. So quote the scripture right, please. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plan to give you hope and a future. It comes at the end of death and exile. It's fine. Don't take it off your dining room wall. But at least know what it means. Know your history and know that it points to Jesus, Messiah. God's word through Jeremiah the prophet concerns itself with death, burial, and resurrection. I want you to hear Jeremiah 29 and then 30, 1 through 17. If you can't concentrate, close your eyes and just listen. If you've got your Bible here, open it up. Read along with me. 29th chapter of Jeremiah, the first 14 verses or so. And then the first 17 verses of chapter 30. I'll stop walking so as not to distract. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. 
Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray for Babylon. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not let, listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. What's he saying there? He's saying anybody that tells you Jerusalem ain't going down, that the temple isn't going to be destroyed, and the sacrificial system isn't going to go away, if they say God will save us like he's always saved us in the past, they're lying. You're not getting saved this time. Everything's going to be destroyed, and you are going to be carried into exile. Write it down. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I'll be found by you, declares the Lord, and I'll bring you back from captivity. I'll resurrect you. I'll gather you from all the nations and places where I've banished you, declared the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. And then chapter 30, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Write in a book all the words I have spoken to you. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess, says the Lord. These are the words the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard, terror, not peace. Ask and see. Can a man bear children? Then why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor, every face turned deathly pale? How awful that day will be. No other will be like it. What he's talking about is the coming destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. In that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I'll break the yoke off their necks and will tear off their bonds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. There's your exile. Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Did you get that? Did you hear what he just said right there? Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. If there is a messianic passage in this book, that's it. He said, I will bring the Messiah to them and to the world. Good God. So don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed, Jacob and Israel, declares the Lord. I will surely save you out of a distant place, your descendants from the land of their exile. Jacob will again have peace and security, and no one will make him afraid. I am with you and will save you, declares the Lord, though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only in due measure. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. This is what the Lord says. Your wound is incurable. Jerusalem's going down and you're going off to exile. Your injury beyond healing. I don't care how much you beg me, it's going to happen. There is no one to plead your cause, no remedy for your sore, no healing for you. All your allies have forgotten you. They care nothing for you. I have struck you. I have struck you as an enemy would and punished you as would the cruel. Because your guilt is so great and your sins so many. Why do you cry out over your wound, your pain that has no cure? 
Because of your great guilt and many sins, I have done these things. I have destroyed Jerusalem, the temple, and the sacrificial system, and I have carried you off into exile. I have done these things to you. But, that's always a good part of the scripture, isn't it? When God says, but, (laughs) all who devour you will be devoured. All your enemies will go into exile. Those who plunder you will be plundered. All who make spoil of you, I will despoil. But I will restore you to health. And I will heal your wounds, declares the Lord. Because you are called an outcast, Zion, for whom no one cares. Death, burial, resurrection. Go back to the thesis. Jeremiah was a prophet in the 6th century BCE who prophetically declared death, burial, and resurrection foreshadowing the Messiah, Jesus Christ, okay? Now, let me show you these scriptures from Jesus' life. When you look at John 2, I'm going to do you a little Bible study here, okay? After Jesus spends 40 days in the Judean wilderness, fasting, being tempted by Satan, he wins that battle, is ministered to by angels. How far is the Judean wilderness from Jerusalem? It's right there. (laughs) It is right there. That's on the outside of the walls of Jerusalem is the Judean wilderness. What's the first thing Jesus does after he is restored to health? When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts. Both sheep and cattle, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He's replaying what happened in the book of Jeremiah. That's not accidental. It's intentional. He's saying the prophecy of Jeremiah is coming true in me. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. That's much later down the line. The Jews then responded to him. What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. After Antiochus Epiphanes came in and tore everything down, there was a great temple rebuilding project. That was long after they had come back. And you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person." When Jesus goes into that temple the first time, and I'm a believer that he cleared it twice, once at the beginning of his public ministry and once in the last week that he lived before he was crucified. When he went in there the first time, he said, do you remember the book of Jeremiah when everything got torn down, when the walls of the city were destroyed, when the temple was destroyed and the sacrificial system was destroyed? You guys are going to do this to me. I am Jerusalem. I am the temple. I am the sacrificial system, and you're going to do it all over again in me. And this time, it's not a lived out parable. This time, it's real, and I'm going to deliver you from your death, from your exile. If you come out with me, I'll rescue you. I'll resurrect you. I will be the first to be resurrected from the dead. Who else wants to come with me? This is the first statement by Jesus that Jeremiah's prophecy is fulfilled in him. Hmm. Matthew 12, people come to Jesus and they're constantly seeking after a sign. 
Then some of the Pharisees, this is after the first clearing of the temple, and teachers of the law said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Jesus answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Exile, burial, 70 years, three days. It's the prophecy alive in Jesus. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it for they repented. Jonah and the whale (laughs) and the preaching of Jonah and now something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom and now something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is saying, I am the fulfillment of these things. Look, when we stand up here and we ask you to give your lives to Jesus Christ, it's way more than just going to heaven. It's so that you can rest in the resurrected Lord and addiction won't have control over your life anymore. It's so you can rest in the resurrected Lord and anger will not control your decisions, your words, your movements, anything that you do. When death and death and death comes and you don't think you can take another step because Jesus lives, you live too. See, this is what this whole thing's about. I don't care if you join our church. I want you to be in the family of God. At some point of Jesus' public ministry, he draws a line, and he says, all of that stuff that I was doing, teaching and healing and so on and so forth, it's all going to change now, and everything starts moving towards the cross. This is Matthew 16, 21 to 28. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and the third day be raised to life. Now, we in this world behave much like Simon Peter because we don't want to welcome the true Jesus, the dead, buried, and resurrected Christ. We would prefer a Jesus that just performs signs for us and gets us to the other side. There's more to it than that. There's far more to it than that. I'm asking you to give your life to Jesus Christ, not manipulate Jesus into your own means. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, you get behind me, Satan, for you're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Look, I don't care whether you have Jeremiah 29 whatever on your kitchen wall. I don't care. But don't manipulate the word of God to suit your needs. This is what it says. Read the word of God for what it says. This is the point of the sermon where my dad would look at me and go, stop yelling at those people. You're not mad at them. And I'm not mad at you. I'm not. But what are we doing here? What are we doing? Who are we really believing in? Now, come on, guys. And I'm with you in this. I mess this thing up as much as you guys mess this thing up. Okay? This is the second clearing of the temple. Matthew 21, 12 to 17. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. See, they weren't even allowed to be there. Do you understand that? Because they had a physical impediment, they weren't even allowed inside into the courts. And Jesus said, no, you come and I will heal you. I'm the temple. I'm the temple, Jesus said. 
Whoo, no wonder he got himself killed. But when the chief priests, I'm in verse 15 if you're following along, and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things Jesus did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Jesus has upset the apple cart. This is like all the people saying to Jeremiah, don't don't tell them the temple's going to be torn down. Don't tell them Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. Don't tell them you're going to be carried off to exile. We're we're Israel. No, it's going to happen like God says it's going to happen. And that's what Jesus said. Do you hear what these children are saying, they asked Jesus? Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of the children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. When you get to Matthew 23, Jesus starts dropping the hammer on the leaders of institutional religion. It's heavy, man. When I felt like I was called to the pastorate, my granny pulled me to the side and she said, don't be so quick to run in there. Because you, son, are going to be held to a higher standard. Look, I'm going to be a little mean here for a second, so gird your loins, because here it comes. Okay? <laughs> you can say whatever you want to say on Facebook. You got to think about it. And I got to think about it. And you got to think about it. Because the world's looking at us because we're public officials. We don't have 20 people in this congregation anymore. They pay attention to what we do. When you go to the grocery store, you can buy whatever you want at the grocery store. Everybody looks at what I'm putting in my cart. Hmm? You can order whatever you want at Texas Roadhouse. They're looking at me. Is that true? If you lose it on the sideline, ain't they watching? Always. When I left my dad's shop to go into the pastorate, we played Tennessee in basketball. At that time, we had seats five rows behind the Mountaineer bench, and I went loony one night when we played Tennessee. And guess who was on television? (laughs) And a customer from Beckley calls me right after the game, and he goes, hey, Kane, Where do you sit at the Mountaineer games? I said, right behind the bench. He goes, oh, I saw you. And you went into the pastorate? (laughs) Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the, you see what I'm saying? You better think about what you're doing because you are a a representative of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What does Jesus say to the leaders of institutional religion? You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them will, you will kill and crucify, others you'll flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And you'll throw them in wells that are muddy at the bottom. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that's been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I tell you, all this will come on this generation. And listen to what he says. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you weren't willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus never went back to Jerusalem. Now you can say, oh yes, he was there. He was resurrected in Jerusalem, but he said, boys, meet me in Galilee. He ain't walked the streets, and he won't until he comes back and eats. Jesus left the temple. This is the last week of his life. He's cleared the temple. He's going there, teaching every single day. 
And he walks out of that temple. Now watch what his disciples say. This is telling. When his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Hey, Jesus, how about that temple? Isn't it grand? Isn't it glorious? Isn't it wonderful how we've built it all back? And Jesus says, do you see all these things? Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. When you all were at the Wailing Wall, was there a temple above that? No. Ever seen a temple there, Stephanie? You've been there twice. Now let me ask you something. What would have happened if me, Daniel, and James would have walked down to that wailing wall? Now, you think about this. Instead of us sticking prayers in a retaining wall. Think about that. What if we would have walked down to that retaining wall and said, I don't know why you all are down here screaming and yelling about a wall. The temple is not going to be rebuilt. Jesus of Nazareth is the temple, and he has been rebuilt. He is resurrected from the dead and coming again. And all of you should give your lives to Jesus Messiah. If I did that when we were there 18 months ago, do you think I would be standing on this platform before you right now? There ain't no way in Hades I'd be here. My hind end would still be in a Jerusalem jail. Who's the temple? Jesus is. And you have to decide whether or not you believe that. God doesn't care one lick whether that building's rebuilt. And I know some of you will disagree with me about that. Jesus is the temple. The temple has been rebuilt. In three days, death, burial, resurrection. That's what we're celebrating for the next 46 days. That's what we're doing here. So let's celebrate. Let's give our lives to it. Whoo, goodness. He's crucified, he's buried. And on the third day, after the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, don't be afraid. For I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen. Just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him. Now I've told you. This is our faith. This is what we're asking you to give your life to. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, and if you've been around me for any point of time, you know I love this passage. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received. See, you have to intellectually receive what I'm saying to you tonight. And then when I say to you, will you give your life to Jesus Christ and on which you have taken your stand? It's not enough to believe it in your head. You have to stand for this. You've got to stand for it. In season and out of season. When everybody's telling you, oh, you're crazy. No, no, no. This is what it is. This is what it is. By this gospel, you're saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. On Sunday morning when I talk to you about John the Baptist, I'm going to talk about messianic rhythm. Messianic rhythm. After they're baptized for repentance, the crowds, the tax collectors, law enforcement, religious leaders, 
They say, what do we need to do? And John the Baptist says, repent and be baptized. And then live according to messianic rhythm. You can't accept Christ and live however you want to live. I can't accept Christ and live however I want to live. Christ must flow from the abundance of my heart. Good God. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. For what I've received, I've passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died. Jerusalem was torn down. The temple was destroyed. And the old way of sacrifice ain't no more. Read the book of Hebrews. That's what it says. You don't have to kill bulls and goats and sheep and doves. You don't have to do that no more. The sacrifices are over. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. 70 years of exile. Sign of Jonah. Oh, I know you want me to shoot some fireworks off. But the only sign I'm giving you is the sign of Jonah. I'm going to lay in the ground for three days. And then I'm coming out. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And I love how Paul says this. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's Simon Peter, and then to 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, which I love this next line, because he didn't write this on February the 18th or 17th or whatever the heck today is of 2021. He wrote this a couple of decades after Jesus resurrected from the dead. Listen to this. And then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. Now, what does that mean? If you don't believe me, go ask one of them because they're still alive. What if I were to say to my grandmothers when they were still living, Pearl Harbor never happened. The heck it didn't. My grandmother made planes. How many of you remember where you were on 9-11? How many can you describe it in detail? I know exactly where I was. You can even ask one of them. I love that. I love it. Hmm. (laughs) Though some have fallen asleep. A couple of them died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. That's interesting. For I am the least of the apostles and don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But, isn't that great? What sin can you not be forgiven for? Nothing. Just come on. You can kill Christians and God will still forgive. What? Paul killed Christians and God said, y'all come. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. This is what we're celebrating for the next six weeks, for the next 46 days. This is why we carry around nails in our pockets. This is why we have prayer vigils. This is why we are who we are. This is what it means to give your life to Christ and live for this every day, day in, day out. Let's finish it up. The high story of Jeremiah is the story of uprooting and tearing down, destroying and overthrowing, building and planting. It is a foreshadowing of Jesus Messiah. Go ahead. Monday afternoon, in the middle of that crazy ice storm, James comes into my office. We were the only two here, and we started talking, and he starts telling me about this book he's reading. He said, there was this amazing illustration in it. The man said that when you have a huge rock in the middle of a lake, and you're on that rock, It doesn't matter whether the sea around that rock is choppy and going crazy or as smooth as glass because your life 
is founded on that rock. James, that was so powerful. And when we ask you to give your life to Jesus Christ, I'm not up here to tell you we're going to make the waters of your life smooth as glass. Sometimes it's going to be hell. And sometimes you're going to be fighting for your life. And sometimes you're going to be down in the deepest mud. But when you give your life to Christ, you grow like the lotus. You stand on the rock. And none of it matters. Because you are founded in the king. Good God. Whew. To be present and to prepare, we got to remember. James gave me permission to preach for an hour tonight. He said, Mark Driscoll speaks for an hour and 15 minutes and nobody cares. And I thought, well, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I was only going to preach 10 minutes, so blame James. Jeremiah prophetically declared death, burial, and resurrection as immediate judgment to the 6th century BCE Judah and Benjamin. And this prophetic declaration pointed to Jesus Messiah and the Creator's rescue of all creation. As we've been doing, we're preaching you to a verdict. So I want you to think about this as you come forward. As the praise team sings, you come up here and get these nails. And let me say this too. Please do this. Just put your mask on if you would while you walk up here. Please, let's be polite to one another, okay? When you come up as they're singing and you get these nails, all right? As you look to the past, Look at your past. Think about all the muck and the mire, the death in your past. Do you believe Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is God's means for rescuing us? Can you be rescued from your past by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? I say yes. In this moment, because that's the only thing you got. You only have this moment. You can't do anything about five seconds ago and you can't do anything about five seconds from now. But you can do something about right here, right now. Do you believe you rest in Jesus if you allow yourself to be present to death, burial, and resurrection? And finally, do you believe that if in this moment you allow yourself to rest in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, in all your future moments, my brother Joe, you never have to taste death again. And when it shows up in your life all afternoon yesterday, your kid's going to be waiting there at the door and say, Dad, spit that out. Just come here. I've celebrated Lent more years than he's been alive. And yesterday afternoon, that kid imparted to me life and life more abundant. When I spit death out of my mouth right then and there, I said, I don't have to taste death. I can live, and I can show the people around me that they can live too. Whew. Father, thank you for this tonight. What do you want to teach us? What are you saying to each person in this room right now? Are you saying, I can forgive you? Don't think that I can't. I can forgive you. Matter of fact, I've already forgiven you. So come. Are you saying to people tonight, listen, it don't matter whether the sea of your life is choppy or smooth as glass. This is one time I don't want you to walk on the water. I want you to be founded in the rock. Whew. Would you rest in the death, burial, and resurrection of me? All your life will be founded on the rock. And you're saying to people tonight, you don't ever have to taste death again. Oh, it'll come. It'll wear you out and empty your tank. But as you're praying for that woman who's saying goodbye to her husband, and as you're praying for that friend of yours who's fighting for his life, 
And his little girl looks at you and says, don't cry, Rev. You don't ever have to taste death again because I'll send your kid to you. And he'll say, Dad, I'll hold you as long as you need to be held. When you're weak, God gives me strength. When you're cold, God gives me warmth. Dad, when you don't have anybody to protect you, even though you've protected me all those years, I'm going to protect you right here, right now. You just stay here as long as you need to, Dad. Come. Give your life to Christ. Jesus, it's in your name that I ask for these things. Amen. Come, please.